Okay, it is now 101 Central Time, and I think we're going to go ahead and get started. So welcome, everybody, on behalf of the Discussion Group Steering Committee of ACRL's Instruction Section uh, to our Midwinter Virtual Discussion Forum. Um, this is an annual offering that is, as the name suggests, um, offered around uh, midwinter. Uh, that heightens awareness and engages conversation around current topics in library instruction. I'm Patrick Wolmet, and I'm the chair of the Discussion Group Steering Committee. Um, and I am pleased uh, to introduce our hosts, Rebecca Lloyd, Christina DeVoe, and Annie Johnson from Temple University, who are convening this forum uh, titled Embedding Scholarly Communication in Your Instruction Practice, a Coordinated Approach. And um, at the end, I will be asking, uh, calling your attention to a feedback form uh, to make sure that uh, we get feedback that will help us develop future um, forums. But um, for now, please join me in welcoming, welcoming Rebecca, Christina, and Annie. Great. Thank you, Patrick. Um, so before we get started, I um, just want to tell you a little bit more about each of us. Um, so I am Rebecca Lloyd, and I'm a reference and instruction librarian at Temple University Libraries, and I'm liaison to the departments of history, Spanish, and Latin American studies here. Um, like many of you, I have a lot of different responsibilities, including instruction, research services, collection development, and outreach, and have been become increasingly involved with scholarly communication over the past year. Hello, I'm Christina DeVoe, and I'm the English and Communication Librarian at Temple University Libraries. And similar to Rebecca, I have responsibilities related to instruction, research, collection development, and outreach services. Um, I work with faculty and students in media-related disciplines, you know, like journalism, media studies, public relations. Um, so those who are producing multimedia-rich content across platforms and formats. And I'm Annie Johnson. I'm the Library Publishing and Scholarly Communication Specialist at the Libraries and uh, Temple University Press. I have a very long job title, as you probably noticed, but um, I basically spend my days helping faculty and students use digital technologies to share their research in new and innovative ways. So we uh, have a couple ways that we're hoping that you all can participate today. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about our experiences at Temple, but we really want to hear what you all are doing on your campuses. So to help facilitate this, we're going to be doing some polling. Uh, we're also going to be asking a series of discussion questions. And because there are a fair number of us, all of your mics are muted. So please use the chat box to respond to any of the discussion questions. We've also started a Google Doc if you want to take any notes or put any additional thoughts, and you can see the link right on the slide there. And if there are any ideas or questions that come up that you want to broadcast to others who aren't a part of this webinar, we uh, have a hashtag, a hashtag embedding Skullcom, so feel free to use that, and we will be monitoring that as well. Does anyone have any questions about how to participate in the forum today? Okay, great. Okay, so... Next, um, we'd like to learn a little bit more about all of you, and so we're going to be, I'm going to be launching a few different poll questions, one at a time, um, so hopefully this will cooperate. Let's see, so hopefully you can now see a poll question. And if you go ahead and just take a couple seconds and let us know what type of library you are at. Okay, so um, sharing those results, hopefully everyone can see them. Uh, so it looks like, yeah, we've got mostly folks from research universities and then uh, a lot from liberal arts colleges as well. Great, thank you. Um, so next, so next, I'd like to learn, now that we know kind of what types of libraries you're at, um, we'd like to learn a little bit more about your responsibility. One second. Ah, there we go. Okay, what your um, primary responsibility is at your library. OK. 
Okay, great, thanks. So, mostly instruction, a few other areas, a couple Skullcom, and some other. All right, and finally, um, we'd like to check in and see before we get started talking about scholarly communication um, to hear from each of you all about your familiarity um, with scholarly communication. So, that most everyone is somewhat or somewhat familiar, fairly familiar. Um, a few who are totally new to the topic, and a few who are experts, uh, which is great to have a range of, of contributors here. Okay. Now I'm going to turn it over to Christina, um, who's going to talk about scholarly communication and information literacy. Okay. Thank you, Rebecca. Okay. So that helps give us a better sense of who's in the proverbial room. Um, so we're going to provide this little background information, some context. Right. So in 2011, then ACRL President Joyce Ogburn's compelling phrase, lifelong learning requires lifelong access, very quickly encapsulated conversations about scholarly communication and information literacy you know, that had been bubbling at ACRL and ALA Annual that year, calling for new directions. Now, within two years, a number of publications came out, some of which we listed in the recommended readings for today on the instruction section's website, highlighting the need for academic librarians to evolve their roles and take the lead in those two core areas amidst emerging digital technologies and a rapidly changing scholarly publishing landscape. Now, the changes in the scholarly information environment are, according to Duckett and Warren, quote, highly relevant to the undergraduate experience in higher education, namely how scholars communicate, how they create, share, vet, discover, process, and access new knowledge, end quote. This is a key distinction because discussions about scholarly communication so often tend to center around the experiences of faculty and graduate students. You know, for example, the journal pricing crisis, identifying predatory publishers, interpreting impact factors and alt metrics, et cetera. Moreover, Duckett and Warren reinforce the convergence of scholarly communication and information literacy by claiming that, and you can see this from the slide, quote, Understanding the social world of academic communication, discourse, and publication practices goes hand in hand with students developing the skills to discover, evaluate, and use scholarly information in their academic research projects. Now, in their 2013 white paper, the Working Group on Intersections of Scholarly Communication and Information Literacy elaborated further Acknowledging the importance of librarians, but not just instruction librarians, adopting and adapting evolving pedagogical approaches to further enhance student learning. They point out that assignments in the disciplines are changing so that students are now more engaged in project-based experiential learning opportunities where publishing and presenting, you know, like in student journals or symposia or poster sessions, is oftentimes the focus or culmination. In fact, as the working group exclaims, and you can see this from the slide, quote, as part of the undergraduate experience, students now have more in common with faculty since they are making discoveries with firsthand knowledge and are increasingly involved in the production and new knowledge and consequently publishing in a variety of formats, end quote. These types of classroom opportunities help increase the level of student investment, recasting and empowering undergraduate students as producers of new knowledge. These new learning opportunities, though, require a different skill set or information fluency or transliteracy, such as awareness of copyright and licensing issues, choosing appropriate online publishing venues, accessing and preserving disseminated content, etc. Now, 
The need for this is real because as Keener aptly notes, it extends outside of the classroom after graduation. And here I quote, although only a small percentage of our students will find themselves in research fields in the future, all of us are content creators and users. It's sort of like a, we're all in this brave new world together idea. As an aside, Keener offers some nice scenario ideas for introducing copyright to the classroom. If you'd like to take a look at her article. Now, to be successful at integrating scholarly communication and information literacy in the larger, I'm sorry, requires the larger library infrastructure for securing space, for establishing new services, as well as for identifying relevant experts and partners. This brings to mind the image of something like, you know, like, like a village, as no instruction librarian, or liaison librarian for that matter, is an island. And here I'll come to a close by noting what the working group explained, quote, both scholarly communication and information literacy programs thrive only when the librarians involved are actively collaborating across campus through involvement with teaching centers, publishing and grant support offices, and close communication with deans and provosts, as well as individual faculty. Okay, so now I'll hand things over to Annie, who's going to focus on how we're trying to do that at Temple. All right, thanks, Christina, uh, for that good, good overview. Um, so what does the scholarly communication program look like at Temple? Although I have scholarly communication in my job title, I'm not the only person working on scholarly communication issues. Just to give you guys a few examples, our associate university librarian, Stephen Bell, has been advocating for the use of open educational resources by our faculty for many, many years now. Our Digital Scholarship Center supports a number of digital publishing platforms for faculty and students, like Scalar and Omeka. And our liaison librarians, like Rebecca and Christina, you know, regularly talk to faculty and students about the high cost of journals, copyright, open access, and more. So because scholarly communication intersects with so many people's jobs at the library, we have been looking at different ways to organize all the work that we're doing in this area. And I don't know how many of you had the opportunity to read the research libraries issue piece on Cornell's team-based approach to scholarly communication. But um, you know, we're not the only library that is thinking about this. How do we organize all these different activities that really you know, touch so many different positions? How we're approaching it is that we've recently formed what we're calling the Scholarly Communication Strategic Steering Team. This is a cross-functional team of six staff members who oversee projects and activities in our library related to scholarly communication. And that team involves Rebecca, Christina, myself, a librarian from our health sciences library, uh, and two of our uh, technology librarians, digital projects librarians. So we've got, kind of got a good mix of, of skills and backgrounds on the team, which is really nice. The team has four main responsibilities. Our first is to develop a holistic understanding of scholarly communication activities within the library and the university in order to make connections, improve communication, and reduce duplication of effort. The second is to provide support to the library's various working groups in the scholarly communication sphere. So as I said, you know, we've already got a lot of groups in our library that are working on things related to scholarly communication. For example, we have a research information management group, and they are focusing on our uh, campus implementation of symplectic elements. So that's connected to scholarly communication. So, so the idea behind the steering team is that they will help um, you know, coordinate with all these different groups who are working in this area. A third, third responsibility is to foster education and outreach on scholarly communication topics. So this steering team kind of grew, grew out of a more ad hoc working group that we had around open access. And that group was responsible for planning all of our activities around open access week, open education week, um, fair use week. And so that's, that's going to be an, that's an important part of this team as well, too. 
Um, and then the final responsibility is really to just identify areas of need and anticipated future growth. As you all, I think, probably know all too well, uh, the landscape is changing all the time. There's always uh, something new in the news to keep up with. So part of the team's, team's role is really um, what's next for us? What do we need to be thinking about and focusing on? So we've only really just gotten started with our team, but I think we're pretty excited about this kind of what I think is a pretty unique approach to supporting scholarly communication in the library. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about some specific examples of what we've been doing. Um, so right now I'm going to turn it over to Rebecca, who is going to get into more of the discussion part of this. Right. Thanks, Annie. That was great. Um, so yeah, so now we're going to open up the discussion portion. Um, so what we'd like you to do for each of the discussion questions is to type your responses into the chat box, and then we'll um, take turns kind of calling out some of your, your examples and sharing them um, verbally with the group. And while you all are thinking and reflecting on the first question um, that we've got here, I'll share with you an example from Temple. Um, of how we are incorporating topics related to scholarly communication um, into our instruction here. Uh, so I recently worked with a Spanish general education class on a semester-long Wikipedia assignment um, with support from Wiki Education's classroom program in which students in the course created or made significant edits to Wikipedia entries on food topics. Uh, compared to working on a typical paper, um, students were much more committed um, to the research process given that their work had a public audience um, and was contributing to the body of existing knowledge on their topic. Um, it led to discussions about the Wikipedia publishing culture as one among many publishing cultures, um, and we had productive conversations about the reliability and ownership of crowdsourced information online. Uh, students emerged with a more nuanced understanding of Wikipedia's value and of its limitations, and they were very proud of their contributions to the site. Um, it was a great way to engage students, undergraduate students, as content creators um, connected to many of the ideas in the ACRL framework, and uh, we are here at Temple are encouraging more faculty to adopt Wikipedia assignments. Great, and uh, Brian Moss wrote in the chat here, Rebecca, I do more reference than instruction, but I regularly explain scholarly communication to students at the desk. Not all the time, but when, when appropriate. How do you, Brian, I'm curious, how do you, how do you work that in um, to when students come just kind of randomly approach you at the desk? It does seem like that would be a good, good time to grab students. Brian says, depends on the situation, but often it's to explain the limitations they're encountering, such as articles beyond, behind paywalls. Oh, yeah, that's really good. Yeah. Um, and then Nancy Curtis wrote, uh, she has presented a workshop on author IDs, especially ORCID, at Campus Scholcom Workshop. She's also working up something on open access for upper-level chemistry class. Oh, very cool. Uh, Janet writes, I have found it vital to change the term I use as faculty to partner and not use the word serve. That, that's an interesting comment, Janet, because I, I feel like I hear that a lot in, um, in, in, in digital scholarship discussions about uh, relationships with faculty, but I, I feel like I haven't heard that as much in, in um, you know, discussions around scholarly communication, but I, I think that's exactly right. I noticed that John talks about um, sort of working with the liaisons to sort of um, help them become more informed. I'm curious, like, what are some of the types of, I don't know, perhaps training opportunities or, or additional kind of continuing education or professional development that some of the liaisons are taking there? Wow. 
lots of workshops here and here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and we'll talk more in a little bit also about, about some of the different ways that we're kind of educating our liaisons here and making sure that kind of everyone has the, the knowledge that they need and the expertise that they need um, in, in their instruction and liaison roles on SCALCOM. That's Black Rights. I created a workshop with our undergraduate research office to help students get involved in undergraduate research called Join the Research Conversation. It uses the lens of scholarly communication and scopus to help students find potential research mentors on a very large campus. Oh, that's really cool. I don't know if we, do we have an undergraduate research office? But I really like that idea. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I join the research conversation is a nice way to, of framing it, too. So, and Brian Moss writes again, like advocating um, for open access at the University of Kansas um, and using that as an opportunity to explain, you know, that why open access and OER are very important. Ooh, Brittany mentioned the Faculty Institute. Ooh, was this kind of like a, like a, a week-long boot camp sort of thing or something different? I'm also curious if that was during the summer or during regular academic year or something else. Mm -hmm. The two day log institute, okay. Wow, Brittany, do they do they get anything for um, joining you or or are they just volunteering to, to do it for two days? Is there an incentive? Yeah, <laughs> I should say that. Is there an incentive? <laughs> they do get a small stipend. Okay. <laughs> that helps. And then um, Sherry also noted that she uh, uses Harry Potter as a frame to get students looking at Harry Potter related articles and discussing in their houses what they think is scholarly, what's not, and why. That's an interesting idea, too. Yeah. yeah. And Lisa Villa, um, Via says uh, that she's not an instruction librarian, um, but has been attending um, their meetings and looking for ways to help them integrate Stalcom topics into their sessions. Um, so, so Lisa, is your background then in scholarly communication, is that right? Um, and working to help promote your institutional repository uh, when they meet for students. Okay, great. So trying to encourage students to, to deposit content in the IR as well. Okay. Um, and I'll just share one other example. Oh, great. So Lisa wrote in that she's the manager of the institutional repository and their go-to for Skullcom. Excellent. Um, and I'm sure that your liaison would appreciate your, your sharing your expertise with them. Um, I'll just share one further example from, from here at Temple. Um, another way that we've um, integrated uh, scholarly communication into our um, instruction is uh, Christina, um, who works with our media studies program, in a lower level undergraduate media studies courses um, is introducing concepts like creative commons, public domain, and copyright um, during in-class sessions um, with, with her as their instruction librarian. Um, students learn how to recognize, distinguish between, and contribute different kinds of licensed content, whether it be audio, still image, video, in preparation for an upcoming multimedia production assignment. Um, students also gain insights into applying Creative Commons licenses to their own creative work. Um, Christina has also worked closely with instructors to include language within syllabi that discusses originality of work and attribution in context of using CC licensed and public domain content. Yeah, and I think one of the things I really like about working with those classes is the idea of empowering students. So 
at the end, students really kind of take back that, you know, this is, this is something they can do for their own work that is out there. That, you know, like they have, they have ownership and they have rights and they have the ability to sort of make decisions on that. Okay, so we're going to switch gears and kind of move to the next question here. So our next question relates to perks and pitfalls. So what are some of your challenges and successes with incorporating scholarly communication into your instruction? Now, while folks are reflecting and typing, one example I'll give is a series of standalone workshops Annie and I developed with some of our other colleagues focused on scholarly output and research impact. Um, we did this about two years ago. Um, the workshop focused on topics like you know, managing your sources or measuring research impact, um, developing your scholarly profile, and amplifying your research. Um, designing the workshops offered us opportunities to collaborate with colleagues across library units and departments that you know, we might not always come in contact with, um, and delivering those workshops and the subsequent kind of train the trainer session to our other liaison colleagues, um, that also kind of helped us to stretch ourselves, you know, to learn by doing, to try something new. Um, and we found that like we, we kind of are flexible when we offer these workshops, you know, kind of trying different times of the year to sort of see when we can kind of capture um, the best audience or sort of like maximize potential there. Now, I will admit, you know, one challenge with standalone workshops, you know, it, it can be issues related to low attendance rates. You know, we've experienced this, and, you know, it's encouraged us to be flexible, you know, in terms of when we choose to offer these workshops, um, or how best or how often to market them, um, and who else on campus we might partner with in order to draw upon already established audiences. You know, so for example, if that's kind of like our um, Office of Research on, on campus, or if that's you know, working with specific colleges and schools, or if that's working with like, let's say our Center for the Advancement of Teaching, you know, kind of identifying you know, good partners who can help us out. Nancy Curtis has a really good comment. She says one of the challenges is Professor X, your students really need to learn about this new concept. You're still grappling with yourself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I we yeah, we've all we've all been there. And as I as I was saying before, I feel like one of the great one of the things I love about scholarly communication is that it's always changing and there's always something new, but that also makes it a lot um, harder to keep up. So John Martin um, has said that um, our biggest challenge is getting faculty to find time, um, certainly to either develop courses that utilize Galcom or work with us to integrate it into existing courses. The last minute syllabus problem. Yes, <laughs> very similar. Absolutely. You know, time, of course, is, is something else to consider. Um, you know, not just in terms of whether there is enough time, because you know, oftentimes it seems like there never is, um, but how much can or should be allocated to scholarly communication-related topics, you know, especially in a course-integrated or one-shot instruction setting. I mean, what do you guys, what do you do? Uh, I don't know the answer to this question. What do you do when you get the syllabus at the last minute? From a professor, I think how much you can try and negotiate, or the kind of conversation you can have with a faculty member to find out sort of yeah. desired needs and outcomes. Yeah, um, and kind of figuring out if you can work yeah. in a little bit about some Skullcom topics, whether it be you know thinking about Creative Commons licensing or the the value of the information and the paywalls that it's behind. That you can kind of weave in to the the more sort of mainstream, typical information literacy and research skills that a lot of faculty expect from us, 
and then kind of maybe let that be a kernel that you can use for perhaps a future instruction session with that um, with that faculty member where you could expand that or they could you know work to develop a new assignment um, that brings more of those issues into play. Nancy Curtis says, last minute instruction requests, that's what evenings and weekends are for. <laughs> uh, and John Martin says, we're working on developing Canvas modules that can work as plug and play units or extra credit assignments in existing courses. That's a great idea. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Oh, and um, Meg Grady's uh, written in that they, uh, we've had some success offering standalone workshops to graduate students, uh, graduate student audiences on open access um, publishing topics. Uh, a challenge has been bringing some of these topics into other kinds of instruction that we offer. Yeah. So I'm going to ping off that, actually. So um, another example that I was going to offer is, is um, sort of taking an existing collaborative relationship and sort of finding an opportunity in there um, to sort of bring in scholarly communication. So, for example, um, we have a really strong collaborative relationship with our university's first-year writing program. Um, you know, here at Temple, all students who are enrolled in first-year writing classes, they attend two library workshops. Um, we have this really great opportunity to reach a large cross-section of students. Um, and with the aid of the framework and a standardized curriculum, um, we've embedded scholarly communication themes. Um, so, for example, early on, students are introduced to the idea of the information life cycle. Um, so just a quick shout out to UNLV libraries for their information life cycle Twilight Zone video. Um, these, this kind of helps us recognize the ways in which similar information can be packaged and you know, how that influences evaluation and access to information. And this then kind of dovetails nicely into discussions concerning the control and or the restrictions to some information or paywalls, et cetera. Meg, I'm curious, what do you, t what do you title those workshops for uh, graduate students? Because I, I know one thing we've, um, we've, we've kind of heard is that, you know, sometimes open access is this, this term that is, uh, kind of like a black box and no one really knows what it is and so are there better workshop titles that we can come up with that will draw people in and not scare them away? Publishing, Meg says, uh, publishing toolkit for graduate students. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, yeah, we've definitely found using the term open access doesn't really resonate much um, with folks outside of library and scholarly communication, so that's a great name. Okay. Sure, so I'm going to turn it back over to Rebecca now. All right, okay, so thank you all for such great examples thus far. Um, so we're moving on to our next discussion question um, about kind of the role that liaison, liaison librarians are playing um, at your own institutions in terms of educating faculty and students about Scalcom, and then kind of the extent to which these are coordinated or not. Um, and so once again, first I'll share an example um, from here at Temple. Uh, so some of our liaison librarians um, have been heavily involved in scholarly scholarly communication outreach and instruction, as you've heard through some of our examples thus far, while others have been um, quite a bit less so. Um, and e in either case, most of the, this activity um, prior to now has been happening in a pretty dispersed and ad hoc fashion, um, where we didn't really have a clear picture of who on campus we were reaching or, or who had the most expertise in particular areas within the library. Um, beyond any our, our Skullcom experts. Uh, so with the establishment of our um, scholarly communication strategic steering team, we are conducting an inventory of scholarly communication activities throughout the library. 
and we sent a survey, um, which was loosely modeled on a research data training survey created by Bresnan and Johnson at the University of Colorado Boulder um, to all of our liaison librarians um, to learn about their coverage of scholarly communication topics, both in their instruction and in their consultations, and then also to gauge their level of comfort on these, these topics. Um, so we've just conducted the, the inventory, or uh, the survey, and we're starting to analyze the results. Um, but through the inventory, some of the things we found is that you know, many librarians are certainly covering copyright, fair use, and or Creative Commons licenses in their instruction and consultations but that amongst many of our librarians, there's still some ambivalence uh, in terms of their confidence in explaining these concepts. So they're covering it, but they could still, I think, you know, feel that they were a little bit more, um, had a little bit more expertise in these areas. So we could offer, you know, gives us insight that we could offer more um, internal workshops and instruction on these issues for staff. Uh, Self-archiving and funder mandates were a couple things we asked about. Um, and those are two areas where definitely it looks like further training um, would be beneficial to librarians. Um, so our goal, you know, with our team and with kind of this assessment of, of where everybody's at right now is to build knowledge of scholarly communication topics among all of our liaison librarians so that we can all offer coordinated support um, to our subject area specific to the needs of each discipline. Oh, Brittany wants to know what were the, the less well understood concepts? Oh, self self archiving and um, funder mandates for sharing of data. All right, so like NIH funding requirements, things like that. Areas where there was, you know, a lot of people said they weren't too confident or were only moderately confident at best. Do do most of you all? I'm curious have um, have a dedicated scholarly communication person in your library, or is it kind of supposed to be everyone's job, or how how do you handle it? <laughs> okay. Brittany says scholarly communication is a small department here at UNLV, two librarians and one fellow. Which actually sounds rather large. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Dedicated team. Okay. Yeah. Whereas Barbara says they don't have a Skullcom person. And and Alice, who's who's in that team? I'm just curious. Interesting. So, some, and like, so Sherry has written, like, there's a, a joint position where it's scholarly communication and also a liaison librarian together is being recruited for. Several definitely don't have a dedicated person at their institution. Quite a few sounds like you, you don't have someone. Yeah. Alice says the team includes four librarians, a copyright librarian, IR, publishing, and the department head. Wow. Yeah, I mean, I, I am really struck by the diversity of, of situations among libraries with how they kind of structure their um, structure scholar, scholarly communication and where it kind of sits administratively within the library. I think um, in our situation at Temple, because we don't have a, you know, a scholarly communications department, this development of this strategic team is kind of one way to address that. And it's also nice, I think, because it gets, you know, people from different areas in the library kind of working together. Amanda says there's a publishing office, and publishing offices in the library, so those folks are dedicated to Skullcom issues. And John Martin says, I'm the Skullcom librarian. As is my supervisor, we have a copyright librarian and a repository librarian, although the latter is in a different department. Interesting. Hmm. 
are, are any of you, do any of you have um, scholarly communication located uh, within a digital scholarship department or center? Meg says we'll be recruiting for a scholarly communication specialist right now, which will be strongly aligned with our digital scholarship team. Yeah, I think we, we definitely see, uh, we have a digital scholarship center here, and uh, we see a lot of overlap um, in some of the workshops that, that they, the things that they're addressing in their workshops. So one thing our, our new team is trying to do is work more closely with our digital scholarship center. Do you want to read Sherry? Um, sure. So Sherry um, says that SUNY Geneseo, oh gosh, don't know how to pronounce it, sorry, um, hosts the head of OER for the SUNY system, and uh, this person is heavily involved in SCALCOM, okay, so kind of at a, at a higher than the um, individual university level, um, got some coordination there, SCALCOM. You know, it strikes me that, like, with, with these different kinds of positions and sort of like how how they're spread out among the library, like it really kind of calls upon the individual librarian to sort of build these types of bridges, you know, both internally and externally to sort of like find your find your partner, find your find your you know someone who's going to help you out anytime you need there. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So uh, our next question here is kind of a big one in my mind, something we've been thinking about a lot lately. How do you market your scholarly communication expertise, both as an individual liaison and as a library to your campus community? Um, and I will say that I feel like marketing is definitely a challenge. Um, one kind of success that we've had here at Temple is working with high, higher level administrators within the university to help us get the word out about some of our services that we can offer and kind of some of the expertise that the librarians have. Um, so one example is that about a year ago, the New York Times, some of you may remember this, <laughs> the New York Times did an article on predatory publishing and the article revealed that Temple had been unwittingly hosting a conference put on by a predatory, a predatory publisher for about two years, which was pretty shocking. No one, no one really realized. Um, so we saw that as a real opportunity for us to say, hey, you know, the library can help with this issue. So we worked with our dean to talk to our provost and tell him, like, we're, this is what librarians can do. We're experts in this area. And as a result of that, um, the provost got us invited to meetings with the deans of research and the deans of faculty affairs. So we ended up going there and doing a doing presentations for both of those groups on predatory publishing. And then the deans kind of went back and they told their schools and colleges about what we were doing. And we ended up doing another series of presentations for, for schools and colleges about predatory publishing. And just to make sure everyone was on the same page, we, we did a, a presentation for staff, for librarians as well, to make sure that they felt comfortable speaking to their faculty about this issue. So that was one, I think, really successful way that we were able to market our, our abilities. Um, but, you know, it doesn't always, it doesn't always happen quite that, that magically. Um, what about the rest of you? Caitlin shared that um, you've gone through their Faculty Center for Innovation, um, that sounds like an interesting entity on campus, um, which is a host and hosted program related to open access there. Um, yeah, it sounds like a great way to get the word out. Faculty Center for Innovation, like what, what kind of innovation? I Actually, <laughs> the Chronicle just had an article about these. Centers for Innovation on campus, <laughs> kind of interestingly enough. Um, you know, another thing that we're just just starting to do 
is that we have a we have a new um, outreach administrator within the library, and her role is really to help basically do the marketing for all of our public events and and put on our public events, but also to work with us with the librarians on promoting workshops. And she's fairly new to the library, but we are so excited to have her on board. And she's just already, I think, come up with a lot of good ideas for us in, in terms of how we can get the word out uh, better to our campus community about the workshops that we're offering and uh, things like that. I don't know how common that is among other libraries to have a dedicated outreach person. I think one of the things that we're really excited about is that it'll be like systematic yeah. in terms of marketing. So like we will know each time like where that content or copy is going out, who's receiving it. So there will be a process. I think that's yeah, and less duplication of messaging. I think which sometimes has been an issue is yeah, you're not quite sure who's marketed to whom about particular workshops and events. So yes, our person will be um, who started is going to really help us in coordinating all of that. And Stephen Bell uh, at Temple mentions how we've been we've been doing more to uh, I lost his thing here with leveraging national. Scalcom events like Fair Use Week, Open Access Week, Open Education Week. Yeah, those those are kind of great times for us to to offer a workshop or something and promote it around a national event. And I should say that we we don't just do workshops too. One way we found, especially for uh, getting undergraduate students to stop and listen to what we have to say about fair use, for example is we set up tables in the lobby of the library and we do things like we have a quiz about fair use and the students fill out the quiz and if they get it right and then their um, name gets drawn out of a hat, they win a, you know, a $20 gift card to the bookstore or something. So that's, that's kind of nice because, you know, you can easily put together a workshop for undergraduates and have, you know, only a few people come or maybe no people come and, I uh, feel like maybe your your time would have been better spent doing something else. But with these the, the kind of tabling that we've been doing around some of these weeks, like Open Access Week, Fair Use Week, Open Education Week, um, we have a st steady stream of students coming through the library anyway. So it's easy to get them to stop and kind of listen to what we have to say. They're a captive audience. Location. Location <laughs> yes. matters. Yes. <laughs> um, so, Lisa also harkens about using OA Week events. Um, and, oh, Caitlin's got a nice description here of the uh, Center for Innovation. It's, so it's your Center for Teaching, Excellence in Teaching and Learning, um, how it's been sort of revamped and rebranded. Uh, and so the reception's been mixed, some proponents of open access and uh, open access text on campus, but then also some concern about quality of material and faculty control over that material in the classroom. Interesting. Let's see. Yeah. So, so just reading, John's had a really great response here. I'm, I'm going to read it. It's a little bit longer, but it has a lot of good content. Um, so saying that most of the, their li liaisons still don't have a real clear idea um, what Skullcom is about. Um, they're a relatively new office on, um, within the library and few have integrated it yet into their outreach or instruction. Um, some of the liaisons are resistant to either learning about it or bothering their faculty um, with something that isn't really their area of expertise. Hmm. There's a real rationing on faculty contact, so we've had to be diplomatic in doing outreach. Uh, we focus on our web pages and libguides, workshop series, occasional presentations, or class visits by request. We try to take advantage of library events to promote our services, um, tabling events, and hosting an, an open access symposium and a faculty editor's roundtable event each semester. Um, that, that is really intriguing that it's been kind of hard for you all to make inroads with your liaison librarians. I mean, I, I do, I mean, I think that that, you know, you, probably that's true at a lot of institutions where I think there's some people who are quicker to, to kind of see how that falls within our, our sort of our wheelhouse and, and others who maybe are a little more hesitant or just feel like they do, still don't quite have the expertise that they need to be able to talk. 
um, effectively with their faculty about it and are hesitant to do so. I guess, yeah, maybe it's a more kind of internal training opportunities for liaisons could be a way to help just sort of break down that divide a little bit so they're a little less hesitant. Um, but I think that is a challenge a lot of places. Um, let's see, and Kathleen has said um, that we are unsure whether our time would be best spent holding workshops and events or to market that we are available for consultations on Qualcomm topics. Yeah, that's a good point because uh, Kathleen, I, I can tell you that I've gotten, I've gotten a number of um, you know, calls or emails from faculty and they're like, Oh, I'm so glad I finally found the right person to talk to. You know, like you know, they you know, I think that um, they don't necessarily know when they have a question about some of these issues, you know, where to go. Um, and I don't know what the, the the best way is yet. Where I think we're still trying to figure out the best way. Yeah. To I, mean, I think sometimes it's like holding the workshops and events, at least just gets the word out that yeah. we exist yeah. and we can offer some support on these, these Qualcomm topics, even if they aren't actually able to attend them. And yeah. so then that might lead to a consultation or a more in-depth follow-up right. question. And, and we've seen in those examples where, like if it's a faculty member or a graduate student who attends a workshop, then they almost, like let's say, testify back to their department or to their yeah. colleagues, which sort of helps um, increase conversations. Yeah. I, I should also say that um, I've had some success with our um, scholarly communications at Temple blog. Uh, it's a blog about different topics, post about once a month or so, um, often have guest posts from other librarians or uh, folks within our, our press. And uh, we put all of our information about our open access publishing fund on this on this blog. And so that kind of leads people there. Um, but then they, they stay for the content as well too. And uh, and we've actually had uh, faculty members who have who have forwarded blog posts to you know graduates, their their graduate student listserv and things like that. So that's been kind of cool to see. All right, so we're running slightly short on time. So I want to get to our last question, which is we know very related to the previous question, but how are you guys collaborating with others on campus to get the word out about your scholarly communication initiatives? Um, I think we have found that it is really, really helpful to partner with other people at Temple. Um, you know, one example that comes to mind is our undergraduate research journal, Minetto. When we, when the libraries decided that we wanted to start an undergraduate research journal, we got in touch with our um, undergraduate honors program to help us kind of develop a strategy and, and recruit students to work on the journal. They have continued to be really supportive and, and just generally awesome. They, they prompt their honors students all the time to submit papers or to join the editorial board. And um, yeah, they're always happy to promote, promote the journal at any kind of honors event that they do, which is great. Another partner on the undergraduate journal has been our university press. And I mentioned that I have this, this kind of joint position between the library and the press. And when we started the journal, we hired five undergrads to launch the journal. And we had them spend the summer basically working at our press offices, which is kind of cool. And the students, they kind of developed the policies and procedures for the journal. journal and as they were doing that, um, myself and press staff, we worked together to teach them about different topics in scholarly publishing. So they were, you know, learning about Creative Commons, but then also thinking, well, what Creative Commons license do we want for our journal? Uh, which was kind of nice because it wasn't this ab abstract thing. It was very concrete. Um, and I, our press staff really continues to work very closely with us on that journal. So I think that's been another, another way that we've, we've tried to partner with other people uh, in some of our initiatives. I imagine that's a really great opportunity for students to attend that experience in their portfolio or their you know, resume or other kinds of materials too. Opportunities there. Let's see. Um, AJ Boston says that they um, have also been using their um, honors college heavily to work on and submit um, to their uh, student research journal. Um, yeah, and also that's been a great place to sneak in 
info lit instruction. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, we've heard that a couple times here today. Sneaking it in. Oh my God. Well, it's like all about kind of finding those moments where it's really relevant to the students rather than this just kind of theoretical concepts that they might need to know about at some point. Yeah. Um, so that's a great opportunity. And I mean, I think another example is that um, you know, I've I've been trying to work with the the graduate school here to um, to help get more support for graduate students who are working on their dissertations around copyright issues. And we actually we did a, a workshop for liaison librarians about um, ETDs, electronic theses and dissertations, and actually invited the um, graduate school kind of I guess you'd say the liaison or the administrator for theses and dissertations to this workshop. So she came and she kind of offered her insights on the process and um, what she was seeing and I thought that was very, very valuable to have her presence there. And I think she was really um, happy to be there and to see that the library was very interested in this topic because she's one person and she gets a lot of questions from graduate students about, you know, what they should do with, about their thesis and dissertation. And so she was very happy to see that, you know, she could refer students to us and she didn't have to, you know, answer all of these questions herself. Anyone else have um, some interesting collaborations with other people on campus that, that they would want to share? Or any just other comments or questions since we're about to wrap up here. John and Jeff are fiercely typing. <laughs> Oh, um, Barbara asks, yes, there, there is, uh, the program is being recorded and it will be available afterwards, absolutely. Right, so while folks are typing there, um, I'll just kind of give a, a quick little wrap up. Um, you know, just, just so you know, this has really been an engaging and enriching discussion. Um, and you know, Rebecca and I, would, I mean Annie, would like to thank all of you for attending and participating. Um, we hope that there were some ideas and suggestions mentioned that you, know, you can take back and share with your own libraries. Um, we'd also like to thank the ACRL instruction section and especially the discussion group steering committee for giving us the opportunity to chat with you all today. Um, just like Rebecca said, the recording of the session will be made available. Um, if you'd like to refer back to our materials, the URL for the slide deck, as well as the Google Doc, um, um, which includes any notes or ideas or resources that y'all shared. Um, and we'll go back and we'll enter in some of the things that we saw up here in the chat. We'll put that in that document, too, um, so you can take a look at that as well, um, as is the Twitter hashtag. Um, finally, um, before we all leave today, um, feel free to reach out to any of us to continue the conversation. We've included our email addresses here. Um, thank you so much, everyone. Um, enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you all.